that. Um, and uh, Wingspan, most of you have probably seen at some point or another is a competitive card driven board game that as of last December has sold over a million copies worldwide, which is a big deal for the hobby board game world for the monopolies of the world. It's, yeah, it's chump that. change, but um, for this sort of game that's aimed at, as a, at adults, that is very unusual, a huge. Um, so I was just gonna talk a little bit about how I came to make Wingspan, how it actually gets made, um, a little bit about the wild ride when it actually came out, and then a little bit about what else I've been working on and, and some game recommendations if you like Wingspan, other stuff I, I think you might like. Um, so I grew up in the 80s playing lots of sort of mass market board games, we call them, um, and lots of card games, big gin rummy and hearts and spades in my family and later in my house in college. Um, that was sort of my gaming world for a long time. Um, and my family was also a big outdoorsy family and I've been going through a lot of family photos in the last year, so you get a few. Um, my, my parents always brag that they took me camping in Joshua Tree National Park as an infant. Um, we were living in Southern California when I was born. This must be the Sierras, I don't know. Um, and then we moved to Southern Illinois to basically the middle of nowhere, um, had a big deck that we spent a ton of time on. And then it just like led into the woods. Our part of our property backed up against the state forest. And so I was just out in the woods when I didn't have my nose in a book. Um, and this picture I included not only for the excellent 70s fashion sense, but also because it was the only one I could find that has um, our bird feeder in it, which I, when I saw this other picture of me standing on the deck, I was like, oh yeah, the bird feeder's right over there. And so I went and found a picture with it in it. But I, I do not remember a time that I didn't know like the common bird feeder birds and what they were like. We had tons of chickadees and cardinals and blue jays and things like that. Um, and then when I was in seventh grade, we moved to North Florida, which is different from most people's mental image of Florida. There's um, a lot of uh, pine, sort of scrub woodland, and a lot of live oaks. Outside of Gainesville, where I lived, there's a huge um, prairie preserve, which is really beautiful, it has these long cycles of flood and drought. Um, and right now, this water, this picture is actually from uh, this past crypt. Christmas, the water on the prairie is the highest I've ever seen it. We were out there. There are bison that were released onto the prairie in the 70s that are still there and are, you know, have managed to propagate. Oh, bison are just waiting around. They're just waiting around. Um, but it's impossible. Um, Florida is another place where it is impossible to live and not just be aware of the amazing, beautiful water birds, especially that are out there. Um, the Sandhill Cranes come and, and uh, over winter on the prairie in Gainesville. And we're seeing more and more roseate spoonbills up there, which is really cool. Um, so I went off to college, came to DC in, in 96 to work for the government. Um, about 2000, met my partner, Matt, who some of you may know. He was definitely on that walk when I ran into Robin. And, um, he leads a lot of walks um, around the DC area with his company, Matt's Habitats, um, doing foraging and, and plant ID and mushroom ID. Um, in, but, so about five years later, we really discovered this new world of board games for grownups, as I call it, or a, a lot of people within the industry call it hobby board games. Um, and it's, I was just totally hooked when I started playing these games. Um, compared to stuff like Uno and Sorry that we played growing up, um, you have much more interesting decisions on your turns. Your decisions matter. There's not as much randomness as there is in a lot of the games we played as kids. Um, and a lot of these games have sort of settings and stories. You're building train lines across the country or you're building castles in the French countryside. Um, they're not as abstract as something like Uno or Sorry. Um, so that was 2005. By about 2013, I was starting to ask, why are there not that many games about things we actually like? 
which is not entirely true. Obviously, there are games about a lot of things, but the, really the most popular hobby board games were in those types of settings that I just talked about. Um, Google. And so I started asking, like, what would it look like if I made a game that was about something that I was interested in? And around that time, Matt and I were starting to be birders. I always say that my spark point was a trip that we took to Costa Rica in 2010. We were already big sort of outdoorsy naturalists. We owned binoculars and a field guide, but we weren't like pr proactively birding that much. Um, more just like curious when we saw something interesting. But in Costa Rica, the birds are just so amazing and everywhere and abundant. And um, I really got hooked. And so Matt asked, what if there was Race for the Galaxy, but with birds? So Race for the Galaxy is another um, game that has some similarities in gameplay. Um, some people have noted to Wingspan. It's one that we were playing a lot when I first started deciding, uh, designing Wingspan. Um, and at that point, I was not familiar with the concept of fail faster. It's a thing in sort of engineering and design of like, just make a thing, a really crappy version of the thing and, and like get it so, to the point that you can test it and see whether it works which is basically what I did without knowing that that's actually like a design philosophy. Um, so these are my very first wingspan cards, obviously handwritten in pencil with information from my copy of Sibley's Bird Guide. Um, but you can see if you're familiar with wingspan, you will recognize that some of the stuff in the upper left hand corner has been there from the very beginning. Um, so the birds, where they live, what they eat, what kind of nest they have. And some things have gone away, like the concept of whether they live here year round or they're migratory. Um, I realized I couldn't really do the bird colors because of color blindness. I didn't feel like dealing with it. Um, so from that very first prototype, I spent a bunch of time just testing it by myself, sort of pretending to be two players, went on to test it with friends and family. After even longer, I was finally started getting hooked into the sort of game design community and went to a great playtesting convention up in Baltimore called Unpub, which is happening next month. If you like to play games, I highly recommend going just as a playtester to see like several hundred designers and what they're working on. It's really cool. Um, and then from Unpub really got hooked into, there's quite a few designers here in the DC area. Um, there's a group called Break My Game that meets once a month. And I now have you know a bunch of people that I just meet with um, separately as well. So by the summer of 2016, I, I thought I was ready to pitch it to publishers. I sent a bunch of just cold emails. I did a lot of research on which publishers might want to publish a game about birds, which given the market was actually tricky to figure out. And I went to this convention called Gen Con, which happens in Indianapolis every August. It's tens of thousands of people. Uh, and I had appointments with three different publishers. And I went and, and uh, showed them my game. And Stonemeyer liked it. So I, uh, a lot of people aren't familiar with sort of the, how the process works. If you sign a game with a publisher, it's a lot like books work for what I know about the book process. Um, so I get a, game, a royalty for each game that sells and the publisher handles a lot of the logistics, the art and the graphic design, the manufacturing, the marketing, all of that. So I've sort of handed my design off to them um, and they consult me on how they produce it, but ultimately they make all the final decisions and handle all of the hard work of actually making a game. Um, but once I had that signed contract, uh, the head of Stonemaier Games, Jamie Stegmeyer, and I actually spent another year going back and forth on developing the game even further um, and made a lot of changes in that final year. So Wingspan would definitely not be the game it is today or as successful it is, as it is without having gone through that process. Um, I just have a few slides about some of the things that we changed. So my original cop version or the one that I pitched, you had to sort of invest in building up your park. It was much more about being a park manager. You had these um, habitats that you had to buy and invest in nesting programs. And that's what made you better at doing the things in the game. 
But people kept saying we just like the birds. So we ended up doing this player mat where the birds are what make you better at doing the basic functions of the game. And I think that that's one of the most satisfying things about Wingspan. Um, and the birds also have actions on them. When I first pitched Wingspan, that was much less significant as part of the game. Um, but I did always have something on the brown-headed cowbird because um, they're nest parasites. And I think it's really cool that this happens in nature, that cowbirds don't make their own nests at all. They just throw their eggs in other birds' nests. I want that, that to be in the game. Um, so that was on the cards. Um, there were predators that actually killed other birds, but as the bird became more important to being uh, successful in the game, like killing one off became a really big deal. So we had to change um, what the predator birds do. So now they kind of go hunting by rolling the dice or looking at cards in the deck. Um, apparently the herring gull, gull used to go through the discard pile. I don't even remember that. <laughs> That's another card that I found that had a power on it early on. Um, so ultimately, you know, because people really liked that cowbird power and some of the other ones, we decided, okay, really all the birds should have powers and we'll activate those as you activate your upgraded row as the birds make it better. And so then you have sort of this, this double improvement to your, to your uh, player mat every time you play a bird on it. Um, the fun facts also came sort of because of the powers. So for most of the time they didn't have them, but I wanted to explain why the cowbird had the power it did. So that got a little thing on the bottom and then we ended up putting the, uh, the little fun facts about all the birds on the bottom of the cards. Uh, another big thing, when I pitched the game, it was only 60 cards and we decided to make a much bigger deck. So I made it up to 170, um, which is a lot. But it really makes it so that you, uh, you're you not gonna see the same set of birds every time, it really feels different from play to play. Um, and I had to keep track of all that in a giant spreadsheet, which um, I'm sort of infamous for, I think at this point. Um, but I had used spreadsheets a lot in my day job, so it sort of comes naturally to me um, that of course, every row should be a bird and then all the information that's on the cards goes in the different columns. Um, I used a lot of eBird data to help me decide which birds should be in. That's not entirely it, but I definitely wanted the deck to sort of represent what people would be familiar with in different regions of North America so that it, so that some of the birds felt familiar to them. Um, and then all the information about habitat and nest type and stuff like that is, is from the Audubon website and the Cornell Lab website. Um, since then for the expansions, Cornell now owns um, the Handbook of Birds of the World, which is another online resource that you have to pay for, but it has all that information or for a lot of the birds of the world, not all of them. Um, I had to teach myself or chose to teach myself how to do web scraping so that I could get some of that information out more quickly and into my spreadsheet instead of having to do it all by hand. And then I used this program called Nandec, which is an amazing resource for game designers that takes all of that information out of a spreadsheet and actually populates it into your cards for you. So say, um, you know, the habitat's in a certain column and I tell the program, okay, take the information from that column and put it in the upper left-hand corner of the card. And so if I like change the formula that calculates the bird scores and score and every card changes, when I first started making cards, I had to go in on every card and change it by hand because I was not using the index yet. When I started using the index, I just push a button and it takes the new score from the spreadsheet and makes an entire new deck of cards with all the information. So that was a huge, huge improvement in my process. A huge part of the process is just play testing. You gotta play with a lot of people. I mentioned it before. Um, this is from the Borden Brew in College Park. Uh, this, this guy and his brother were some of my base play testers, but uh, the names of all the play testers are, I try to put in all of my games. So this is like the, the outside of the inner box of Wingspan, it has everyone's names on it. I wanted to talk just a little bit about how Wingspan actually gets made because it's not just me and I get a lot of the credit, but um, 
there are several artists who worked on the the game beth sobel if you see her name associated with any board game it will be beautiful um she did the player mats the card backs the bird feeder art for it um she's just great and then of course natalia rojas and Ana maria martinez did the bird illustrations i always like to plug that um you can buy prints of their work on their website, Red and Blue Designs, and they also have a book out that's an art book uh, published by HarperCollins that has all of their um, art from the base game of Wingspan. It's really beautiful. It is just lovely to see the, the art full size um, because the cards are actually you know, very shrunk down from their original drawings and paintings. Um, there's a bunch of people involved in the product design of all the different pieces of the game. I'll just highlight the guys who did the Dice Tower. Um, I work for a company called Tower Rex, which has an Etsy site where you can buy their stuff. They're actually based in Ukraine. And right now, um, not only can you go and buy much fancier birdhouses from them um, and other types of Dice Towers, but they also have um a thing where they are taking donations basically to to channel to relief efforts in ukraine uh, a friend of mine david studley did the solo game which is a thing that stillmare includes in all of their games which is a totally separate design process once you have the main game for multi multiple players designed you can go in and create an ai basically that you can play against as a solo player um, and then, of course, Christine, who's the graphic designer for all the cards and the rule books and everything else. So it definitely takes a village to make a game. Um, oh, and this is the Mr. Rogers version uh, portion of my program. Just some footage from the uh, the manufacturing in China. So it goes from the manufacturing plant in China um, onto a big container ship, it has to get over here. Uh, it used to take about six weeks lately. It's been taking closer to three months with all the shipping problems um, that are across all industries and worldwide right now. Um, so I finished my part of Wingspan in early 2018. All those other people were doing all their things and the shipping and the manufacturing for most of 2018. And at the end of 2018, um, Stonemeyer started teasing pictures of the game. And then uh, sales went live in January, 2019 and quickly sold out. Meanwhile, I was on a long planned trip in Belize on an Earthwatch trip, helping tag sharks and rays, which was awesome without internet. So I kind of missed some of the up and down of the initial um, big wave of people buying Wingspan when it went live. But um, it was definitely a super exciting time. I went into this, first of all, manufacturing a game, thinking that I was, you know, a lot of games print like 5,000 copies. The minimum print run for Stonemeyer is 10,000. And I like thought that was a big deal that we were making 10,000. And then to have that 10,000 sell out almost immediately and you know multiple more print runs very quickly was pretty mind blowing. Um, the science editor of the New York Times is on the Stonemeyer Games mailing list. And so was very aware of this whole um, 
excitement over Wingspan and decided to uh, have someone write an article about the process. And um, that definitely made a big splash and did not help with the supply problems. Um, and it turns out when you're written up in the New York Times, a lot of other people think it's news too. So there are a bunch of articles that came out in that spring of 2019. Started getting, so between print runs, people were putting their copies of Wingspan up for sale on eBay and they were getting bid up for like hundreds of dollars. It was bizarre. And every time I ever saw it, I was like, the list price is $60, don't pay $300 for my game. Um, and then in May, it was nominated for this big award called the Kennerspiel des Jahres, which is a German award. This, this trend of um, modern board games aimed at adults really started in Germany. And so this is one of the older and more prestigious awards. Some people call it the Oscars of board games. And um, in July, I won it. And uh, there was actually there was only like six or seven weeks between the time I was nominated and the time I had to go to Berlin and I already had like a site visit that I had planned for the weekend that it was happening in Berlin but a bunch of people were like no no you have to go and it was it's a wild experience there's like paparazzi I was on German TV they have these people in costumes like mascots it's wild and then I flew directly from that to my site visit that I had already planned and that was about the time that I started thinking seriously about quitting my day job. Because um, all of this had been just a side thing for me. Most people cannot make a living um, from designing board games. Um, meanwhile, along with all of this excitement of things being sold out, um, there were other super interesting things happening. So people started passively learning to ID birds. Like I started getting notes like this of, we just saw this bird and I and we knew what it was because we've seen it a bunch of times in Wingspan. And that's a, a pretty amazing feeling. I, uh, I never thought of Wingspan as an educational game per se, but I definitely had in the back of my mind that I kind of wanted to make gamers interested in birding and birders interested in gaming. And I do think that it, it went in that direction. Um, I more recently sort of put a call out for examples of people who started birding because of wingspan. I got this great one of vacation pictures of someone who, uh, or the, I think this wasn't even in, in response to my question, but just someone who had been on a birding vacation and is now keeping a life list and blames it on wingspan. Um, and I'm just a bunch of other people that, you know, this guy says it's, he, he and his friends started playing Wingspan. Now it's part of their social fiber that they're birders and gamers. They bought him little boobies from the World Wildlife Fund. And this one I just love. So she bought Wingspan. She put up some bird feeders. She started birding with Merlin. She got another feeder. She got a bird tattoo, better binoculars. An expansion, some more feeders, another expansion, another feeder. <laughs> I just love that tweet. Um, there are people who have proposed to their partners with wingspan cards. Stonehire makes the template available online, and uh, these are just great. Um, when wingspan first came out, I also got a surprising number of these notes that are like, I, a male gamer, love Wingspan because it is the first game that my wife has ever actively asked me to play or like she still speaks with horror of the time that I made her play this other game but Wingspan she likes and um I got enough of them that I was sort of asking was this part of a larger thing and and uh the publisher Stonemaier their other most popular game when Wingspan came out was called Scythe and uh, he went on and noticed that the Scythe Facebook group is only 9% women, but at the time, um, the Wingspan group was 30% women. This was in 2019. There should be a little date there. I don't know what happened there. Oh, there. Um, and in 2022, I just checked this afternoon, actually, it has actually gone up to 43% women now in the Wingspan group. Scythe hasn't budged much. And this is um, sort of the 
the ugly side of gaming. I don't know what to call it that people don't always like to talk about, but board gaming has a history of being very heavily skewed male. Um, board game designers are 94% white men in the upper echelons of the uh, the top 200 games on uh, Board Game Geek, which is like a crowd rating site for board games. Um, and so Wingspan has also been part of a conversation about like, how can we make gaming more inclusive? How can we make game design more inclusive? And I've been a big proponent of the idea that if we bring more people in, we will have more games like Wingspan that then bring more gamers into the hobby as well. So what else have I been working on? Um, I mentioned Tussie Mussy, which is a little 18 card game about Victorian flower language. Um, that was one of the things I worked on in that year when everyone else was making Wingspan a final product. Um, and also Mariposas during that time, which is a game based on uh, the migration of monarch butterflies. We had been down to see one of the monarch sanctuaries where they overwinter in Mexico, which is, they're just amazing. It's a mind blowing experience. So that had been many years back. And then I read Flight Behavior more recently by Barbara Kingsolver, which sort of imagines the, the monarchs finding a more Northern location to overwinter with global warming. Um, and it got me thinking because I was sort of in game design mode, like, oh, you could totally have a game where there's a map and you're moving your butterflies across the map and you collecting flowers and, and stopping by little milkweed spots to make more butterflies and things like that. Um, so that was the inspiration for mariposas. Um, and I get occasional notes too from mariposas that people are like planting butterfly gardens or things because of um, learning about the, the plight of the monarchs in the game. They actually, we had an extra page in the rule book and they did a really nice sort of fact sheet of um, sort of infographics about the monarchs and, and uh, how much their population has dropped. I am right now working on a game tentatively called the Fox Experiment, uh, based on this experiment that started in the 1950s in Siberia and is ongoing where they selected foxes based on their friendliness, but that personality trait then selecting for that personality trait actually leads to physical changes in the foxes. Um, so people are gonna be rolling dice to sort of simulate that uh, passing on of traits from one generation to the next. And I'm working on a game about mycorrhizal fungi that trade resources with trees. Um, anytime you say trading, that's like instant, like, oh, there could be a board game there. Um, and if you haven't seen it yet, um, there's a great new memoir out by the scientist who did a lot of the recent research um, over the last few decades that's um, just now been coming out about uh, the fact that trees are actually passing carbon from tree to tree through the fungal network, which is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, and I've been working on more wingspan expansions. The next one should be out sometime this year, pending all the manufacturing and, and uh, shipping issues. Um, my goal is to do one expansion for every continent and uh, or region. I don't know if I'm gonna exactly follow continents. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And just quickly, quickly, if you love Wingspan, check out these games. Parks has beautiful, beautiful art of the US National Parks. Um, Cascadia is a fun little tile laying game where you're building up little ecosystems of Pacific Northwest animals. Um, Endangered is a really interesting cooperative game where the, the game itself is sort of causing tiles to come out on the board that are making your tigers go away and, and you are working together to save the tigers from destruction. Um, and then they have, I think it comes with tigers and otters in the base game and then they have expansions for all kinds of other animals. So this one, I have a little caution symbol because it is a three hour long game and much more complicated than Wingspan. But if you are in deep to board games, definitely check out Arc Nova. And fun bonus, um, so you're building a zoo. It has all kinds of animals from all over the world. It's a really cool game. And the ornithologist card is me. 
<laughs> it's published by the publisher that does the German uh, version of Wingspan. And uh, they had this picture from some promotional thing we had done. And they, they contacted me and were like, hey, you want to be in this game? Sure. Use my picture. Um, so I think that's all I had. And I would love to answer some questions. Cool. Thanks, Elizabeth. That was awesome. I loved everything. Hearing about all of it, the uh, how the board, how the game was created, was really cool, um, and the stuff about the genderedness of the gaming world was wonderful. And just, just so much. I was completely entranced by it. Um, so I'll open it to questions and. Um, I'll, it's best if you raise your hand electronically. And I do have one question that came up in the chat early on. Kate asked what your spark bird was. Oh, that's you, a, you a know, bird? I know what a spark bird is, but I, can't, I don't think I really have a spark bird. It was more just that trip. There and are so many birds, you know? I don't really point to one. When people ask what my favorite bird is, I say the Rosie at Spoonville. Wow. They're just crazy. Did you see the one here that was here back in the no, spring? No, we didn't. Last we fall, didn't whatever that was. I try to see it. <laughs> I saw it on the boat by accident. Really? Oh, that's yeah. Funny. Yeah. All right. We've got three questions. Let's start with Ginger. Remember to unmute yourself. Hey, Elizabeth, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. And I have a thousand questions and thanks Anacostia Watershed Society. Um, but I'll just keep myself at one because I'm sure everybody else does too. But did you decide, I mean, from what you told us, it sounds like I, I know the answer, but did you pick out the scissor tail flycatcher for the front of the box? Or is that something that the co company did? And if you did, I'm following it up with a B real quick. Why that bird? Because it's, you know, we don't see it here and you live here. So yeah, please answer that. Thanks. Yeah, so we did not know what the cover bird was going to be, but we had the um, the card art when it was done. Um, Jamie and I went through them all and sort of pulled the ones that we thought might make a good cover. And when we looked at the scissor tail flycatcher on the square box, like the aspect ratio works really well and it's in flight. So it's just like, it's a very dynamic looking bird. Had nothing to do with the actual species. It was just the way that they happened to have illustrated it just worked really well for the box cover. Thanks. But it's a cool species. I mean, yeah. they're pretty awesome birds. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks AWS. This has been wonderful. Hi, Elizabeth. I'm Anna with Capital Nature, a uh, big bird nerd. Uh, haven't gotten my copy yet, but I will definitely be getting my copy of the game. My friend, um, Carrie Seltzer, who I know you know, um, you know, has been talking about this game for quite some time. So I know that I, it's an art related question that I have is um, with the beautiful art. I know you you showed us who the artists were who made the different elements. Did you did you get to select or, or propose who the artists were or did the publisher take care of all that? Did they vet? Did they vet? Like, did they look at all these different kinds? Because there's so many different types of artists that portray the birds. So I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in this particular case, it's this small world story that um, one of the guys who works for Stone, one of the owners of Stonemeyer, his kids go to school with Natalia's kids or did at the time. And it was literally like a playground conversation where she mentioned that she was an artist and he asked what kind of art does she do? And she said, oh, you know, we've been doing sort of stuff aimed at home decoration but mostly nature i like to do a lot of birds and he was like we have a game about birds coming out and it was like they sent me some of her work to sort of say it, would i be comfortable with going in this direction with her style and i was like yeah it looks great but we had said sort of early on like we wanted it to be sort of field guide plus like a little more active poses a lot of times than you're like then a field guide pose needs to be for like seeing all the details of the wing and the eyes. Like they had more um, flexibility for the poses of the birds, but we did want it to sort of feel in that genre of art. Thank you so much. Yeah. There's a follow-up question uh, that fits here in the chat. Are there any artists you would like to work with? Um, 
I always, pretty much on every game, I've been like, can we get Beth Sobel? Can we get Beth Sobel? <laughs> um, no, but there's other great stuff. I mean, I'm not, I don't, the woman who did the art for evolution, if you know that, that's another game I easily could have put on my list of nature games to check out. Um, she does really beautiful watercolor illustrations as well. What's her name? Catherine Hamilton. She does great stuff too. Nice. And how about uh, Vivek? You have a question? Remember to unmute. Yeah. Uh, oh my God. This event is like the the talk of the town. <laughs> uh, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> uh, I I saw this event happening uh, earlier in March, and I was like, I want to attend this. Are there enough space? So I signed up immediately. I signed up one more person. I don't know if they make it or not, but. Uh, I started playing Wingspan like three, four months ago, and I played it consistently every week, uh, sometimes two, three times a week, just because I'm so obsessed with it. <laughs> and after first two times, I've been asking this question, can I, can I help in this game by, <laughs> by offering to uh, list some birds from South America? Because South America, birds are not represented and I feel like it's just a continent of birds where birds are like so beautiful, yes. tropical climate, tropical birds, tropical fruit and all that, you know, uh, jungle sort of feeling and the birds are very different, you know. Yeah. So I was just wondering if there is a expansion coming for South Africa. Oh, sorry. Uh, South America, uh, Peru, Colombia, Guyana. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely have a soft spot in my heart for that part of the world too, because it's where I get hooked on the birds. Yeah, right. um, I do. I want to try and do one for every continent. I'm a little worried that I may get tempted to split out South America from Central America just so I can pick more birds. I don't know. We'll see. Because there's, there's like the tension of like I want all the birds, but at the same time, then I have to actually like design all the bird powers for whatever birds I pick, which is a yeah. lot. Of but, uh, but yeah, Stonemeyer actually does have somewhere a uh, place, if you Google for it, it might pop up that you can suggest birds. Or if you go on the Stonemeyer website on that, there's like a, a wingspan page, it might be on there somewhere. You, there is actually a form you can fill out to suggest birds. But yeah, no, I, I totally hear you on South America. I'll get there eventually. Yeah, actually, <laughs> me and my buddy, we were like so obsessed with the game and we started like, collecting all the birds from South America, which can be in the game. And <laughs> so awesome. we, we, we got like almost 100 birds that, oh yeah, this is what's the wingspan, all that. We started collecting all wow. on our own. And it was just wonderful because when I went to Trinidad and Tobago and Asa Wright Nature Reserve is where I got hooked up into birding. As soon as I was standing there, I saw like almost 25 species of hummingbirds just flowing around me. Yeah, and, and yeah. that's what hooked me up uh, through uh, to birding, and then I saw the cock of the rock in Guyana, and oh, it was just man. marvelous. Yeah. It's then. gonna be so hard. Every continent, I'm just like, oh my god, I don't believe I have to pick. <laughs> There's a lot of enthusiasm like in the comments. Birds, but I have to it. narrow it down to a hundred or something. You know, people in the in the comments are saying, "Split it, split it." There's <laughs> um, another and question from the quick... um, chat. And I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, what is your favorite bird machine strategy to build? <laughs> I understand the question. Okay. I, um, so like wingspan strategy, basically. What's my favorite? I don't, I really like the birds in the base game that move from row to row. Because if you plan, and especially if you can get a couple of them, you can be like boosting all of your rows and you just like, if you know what you want to do next, you can move them to the right place. I don't know. I just find that physically fun to do too. So. Probably not like, there are like a whole uh, YouTube channels now about wingspan strategy. It's crazy. I don't know how this happened. <laughs> Emma, you have a question? Yeah, hi. I uh, love this game. My roommate and I have gotten really into it, and we actually have our own spreadsheet um, <laughs> trying to calculate our scores and see who, who's ahead. On. Um, so our question was, uh, is there a specific way that you assign points to the birds? 
uh, do you have a method of doing that? There is a very specific way. It's, it's all, a well, mostly a formula um, that is based sort of on like, how much does it cost in the, in terms of food? How flexible is it in terms of what habitats it can go into? Um, how much room does it have for eggs? Uh, star nest definitely affects the score because that's good for you. Um, and then what's its power? And that's the one thing that isn't totally a formula that I have to sort of guess and then play test it a bunch and see if people think it feels about right that what I've um, taken off the score for the value of the power that it gives you. Um, yeah, so it's it's like, I had to make it mostly a formula or I would have just gone crazy having to like hand a sign and like think about each one really hard. So it was like the formula itself was the, the result of lots of play testing and sort of gut checking like, oh, these birds that are, that give you a star nest, oh, that's like, they feel really powerful. Like you need to take more off of their score or whatever, you know, so. That's awesome. Yeah, we definitely have seen some birds where we have soft spots for them and we're like, <laughs> This one deserves to be more, but yeah, your right. method makes more sense. <laughs> well, and the other thing is like a lot of the birds, the how much their power is worth really depends on how early you get them out in the game. Uh, and so a lot of people complain about the ravens, right? If you get them out early, it's like really, really valuable. But I just, when I'm assigning a value to the power, I have to sort of assume you get this out in the middle of the game because I have to like pick a point in time, right? And like, how many times are you going to be able to use this? I don't know. Um, so it's, an, it's, it's, it's a little tricky, <laughs> for sure. I have a question and then we'll go to Neil and then I'll read the one from Megan. Um, and my question is, um, it just flew out of my head because I'm trying to do 18 things here. <laughs> oh, the play about play testing, because this is sort of a new world to me. And when, uh, you have that. I know one of my colleagues has been in one of your play tests and they showed some of the slides. What um, what kind of feedback do you get? Do, you know, do they, how does that work? Do, do they tend to coalesce and people will tend to start agreeing? You hear some kinds of feedback more than others like, oh, this, this is great and this doesn't really work. Could you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, I mean, often there's like what people say verbally, which is important. And I often ask like, at the, to kick off the feedback, I'll often say something like, what in this is like the core fun of the game for you that I should not change or that I should double down on? And what in here, like if I was gonna work on something next, like what is the most important thing to change because it's broken or just not fun? Um, and that usually gets people going. Um, but I also get a lot of feedback just by watching people play. And there may be things that they never actually articulate that I just see in the way, like if someone gets way ahead and there's no hope of anyone catching up with them, like the players may or may not notice that, but hopefully as a designer, you can sort of catch that and think about why. Um, we often say like, players will often say, oh, you should change this particular thing in this particular way. And it's important to sort of back up a step and say, oh, are, why are you suggesting that? Like, tell me about what your experience was that caused you to make that exact suggestion because I don't really, like that may not be the right fix, but I'm very curious about what the problem was that you think you are fixing. Um, so it's a lot of stuff like that. Very cool. Uh, Neil H, you have a question? Um, I do. Um, yeah, thanks for a wonderful talk, Elizabeth. Uh, sounds like a sounds like a fascinating game. Um, I was just curious, have you tried to connect with any uh, conservation organizations and potentially offering the game as like a premium for a certain level of donation or kind of any yeah. other marketing connection? with them. And then I'm going to try to sneak in one other question, which is, do you have any uh, a sense of the kind of the age groups that are kind of have been most interested in the game? Yeah. Um, I think we say on the box 13 and up as the age, there are definitely kids if they gr have grown up in gaming families who are playing it much younger. You, you need to be a fluent reader at a minimum 
um because there's a lot of text on the cards okay uh in terms of marketing, I am not that directly involved in any of the marketing. So that's really on the publisher. Um, I know that they have gotten the game into distribution with at least one of the companies that does some of the like gift shop type stuff. Like okay. the, I know like at the Raptor Center in Boise and, and at some other places and Wild Birds Unlimited carries it. Like it's sort of in distribution in some places that aren't typical board game venues. Right. Um, but I don't know if they've had any conversations about like making it available as a as a gift for donations. Yeah. Uh, okay. Seems like you know it can make a more right. interesting and premium than, have, than like yeah. a coffee yeah. mug. Um, the the publisher and I both definitely have like given some of the proceeds sort of behind the scenes to conservation organizations. And he did one very public fundraiser when there, when the wildfires were really raging in, in Australia and the Australia expansion was about to come out and he, he um, sent a bunch of people that way. But. Okay, thank you. So the question uh, from Megan in the chat, uh, what stage of development did the end of round goals come up? I love that there is a more competitive versus less competitive version. Mm. So the more competitive, less competitive thing was a, very, a pretty late game decision of like we were trying to pick and the play testers were like very split on which one they liked better. And then we were like, oh, this is an object that has two sides to it. We can do both. Um, I'm trying to remember what stage the end of round goals, I think, I think the round structure, at one point the game just ended when a certain, when someone got out a certain number of birds, 10 or 12 birds. Um, and then at some point people didn't want to end the game if they could calculate that they didn't have the most points. And so people wouldn't play their last bird and you would get in these weird stalemate things. So we were like, okay, then we have to do a fixed length to the game and we'll play it in a certain number of rounds with a certain number of turns. And then once you have that structure, you can do fun things with like, I, I think end of round goals give people a little uh, direction early in the game of like, okay, I'm a little overwhelmed here, but I know that I want birds with fullness. I'm just gonna focus on that and it like gives me some structure. Um, so I think, that's one of the important roles that the end of round game, end of round goals ended up playing in the game. Let's see, I have another question from the chat. What was the biggest change you made to the game from the original version? So many, I mean, I touched on some of them in my talk. The, the player map was pretty big. I think the player map and the, the the fact the way that you activate the birds that are in the row that you're using um, that that combination of things came together and it was a huge structural change and as soon as I tried it I was like oh yeah this is the direction to go um, yeah and Timothy I did see your hand up earlier Timothy sorry I didn't get to you then asks have you considered an expansion with fantasy birds <laughs> um have i considered fantasy birds not really people ask for extinct birds a lot mm. i might get to extinct birds i want to finish all of the continents first and it's going to take me a long time each one takes me over a year so once i get through yeah you know, asia africa south america Talk to me about other things to do. <laughs> you have to run out of real birds first, huh? Yeah, exactly. Uh, someone asks, are the medals behind you there on your shelf for the game? Oh, yeah. So in 2019, <laughs> I won, how many is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, it's seven. And then this was the one that's outside of the boxes for one of the expansions. And then this is my Kenner spiel. <laughs> <laughs> This is the, the German award that I was talking about. Very fun. 
Let's see. Oh, someone asked. Here's a good one. Can we play test any of the games you're currently working on locally? Yes, you can. Um, if you're on my website, which is Eliz Hargrave, I'll type it in the chat. Um, dot com. There is a sign up spot that you can um, like get on an email list that I have where I will send out um, where I'm going to be play testing. Uh, I do a fair amount at the Game Castle store in College Park, and uh, which I think is the one you mentioned, Robin. And yeah. then, um, Labyrinth Games on Capitol Hill. I'll be at Unpub in Baltimore in May. So yeah, those are those are my main things. They feel right, fast. I need to schedule more, but I don't always have the time to to schedule play tests. <laughs> oh, we have a last couple. We're at uh, three minutes of seven, so let's take a couple more quick questions. We have Neil and then Ginger. Neil, are you there? I am, but I accidentally left my hand up for my previous question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know Ginger? how to take it down, but you can ignore me. Do you have a new question, Ginger? I, I actually do. Yeah, I remember I said I had a thousand in the beginning. Oh. <laughs> Just curious, like Elizabeth, watching you talk about this and hearing the whole like ordeal. I mean, this long, long thing. And and to what it sounds like is, I mean, I didn't know you before, but you seemed like an ordinary person who wasn't super famous before, right? And and then now you went through, you developed a game, and then all of a sudden, I mean you're kind of famous, you know, and so like, in like a very specific part of the world. Yes. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> but I mean, like, how, how does that feel? I mean, or, I mean, maybe that's a dumb question, but just like, has your life changed, you know, or like, did you quit your, like, you already said you quit your day job, I think, right? So, I mean, yeah, like, how did you change or did, did your life change very much? Or do you just um, have more like webinars to give every once in a while? <laughs> um 2019 was a lot of game related travel i went to germany twice that year because in addition to the award ceremony there's also like a huge huge game convention there um and i did a bunch of the conventions here in the states and um part of me quitting my job was like i can't do that much game related travel and do my day job right but and then everything shut down. So then like life just changed in many other ways. But yeah, it's why like, yeah, if I go to any board game event, people will ask me to sign things. It's weird. It's <laughs> cool. <laughs> but I love it. Like it's a great feeling, right? Like I never mind when people come up to me and want selfies or sign things or whatever. It's great. It's a lot of fun. It's That's really awful. fun to meet people who've like had great experiences with the thing that you made. I played a ton. It's like a wonderful thing to be famous for if you're going to be famous. Um, <laughs> yeah, several people in the chat have said this this game got us through the pandemic that has yeah. come up in there. And I'll let's do one last question from Caitlin and then we will close for the night. I've got a question. Have you thought about making a bacterial game? bacterial and like all sorts of bacteria like every single one including archaic bacteria oh my gosh no have you i thought of it <laughs> I, mean, I guarantee that you know exactly as much about game design as i did when i started making wingspan nice. <laughs> there's a lot of bacteria out there <laughs> Well, thank you again, Elizabeth. This was really wonderful. We're grateful for your time, for your knowledge, your generosity, for of sharing all of this with all of us. And um, yeah, you all got her her website in the chat there, yeah. and you can go and uh, play test some of the games, and you can go to Matt's Habitats and go on some of Matt's uh, uh, foraging walks, which I've done at various times through the years, which are great. And uh, they're just uh, wonderful people to, that we're so lucky to have here in the capital region with us. So thanks to you and thanks to everyone for being here tonight. Have a good evening. All right, have a good thanks, evening. Everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.